Well, thank you very much, uh, David and Cynthia. And for Jack Jacobs, I was with uh, Lauren Michaels, the producer of Saturday Night Live last night. And, uh, and I tell you, he's about to have his 40th anniversary of Saturday Night Live, so I'm going to sign you up for it. I'm telling you that right now. Fabulous MC job. Again, David and Cynthia, uh, thank you so very much for hosting this event. I can't tell you how important it is uh, to the men and women in the military to know that their children are going to be taken care of. I also want to thank uh, Holly Petraeus, who extended the initial invitation uh, to this event for me. Holly, uh, you would probably be a little bit amazed to know the number of young spouses and experienced spouses that look to you as the gold standard for military wives. And I will tell you, <laughs> as you know, as you know, my wife George Ann wishes she could be here tonight. You are her idol, Holly, and I just wanted to pass that on to you. So thank you for everything you have done for the men and women in uniform. And also, uh, I had an opportunity to bump into another great officer today, Brian Menes, Colonel Brian Menes. Where are you, Brian? I tell you, if, if you want to know what the future of the American military looks like, go talk to Brian Menes. If you want to see one of the best officers I have ever worked with, Go talk and go meet Brian Menace. He has been everywhere. He has done everything. He will amaze you with his humility, with his patriotism, with his sense of service. He is what this military is all about. Brian, great to see you, and thank you for your service. And again, th thanks for this award, and as always, I, I accept it gratefully, but on behalf of the men and women, in this case, the U.S. Special Operations Command and the rest of the armed forces who have done so very much for this great nation, I'm, I'm really honored to have the opportunity to represent them. I also want to thank the Children of the Fallen Patriot Foundation, really, for the incredible work that you do. Nothing, absolutely, positively nothing, could be more important. As a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, knowing that your children will be taken care of, that they have a future if something happens to you, is the greatest source of comfort when you are on the battlefield. So again, to the fallen patriots, I thank you. You know, I've, I, looking around the room, I see a lot of this generation, and I've watched this generation of young Americans for the past 13 years. They never, ever cease to amaze me with their sense of duty, their pride, their patriotism, and their sacrifice. And history will undoubtedly note that they were, without question, this century's greatest generation. And what impresses me most is that they keep volunteering. They volunteered to join the military, then they volunteered to deploy, then they volunteered to go to combat in spite of all the risks. And I sometimes ask myself why, but I, I really think I know the answer. Overseas, when we lose a warrior in combat, we conduct a ramp ceremony as part of their dignified return to the States. The ramp ceremony is a very solemn occasion. Generally, a C-17 parked on the tarmac has its ramp lowered, and we wait for the casket bearing the remains of the fallen warrior. The transfer usually occurs for some reason early in the morning or the middle of the night before sunrise, and it always seemed to be cold. Extending from the ramp is a formation of soldiers that creates an honor guard, which the casket will pass by. Off to the left is a formation of general officers, dignitaries, and senior non-commissioned officers. Off to the right, a small three-piece instrumental section playing Amazing Grace. And to the back of the tarmac, lining the airfield are hun hundreds, sometimes thousands of additional soldiers, all coming to pay their respects. A Humvee bearing the remains will drive up to the long formation and the pallbearers will walk the casket or caskets up the aisle onto the ramp and board the aircraft. Members of the fallen soldiers unit are the first to follow and then the general officers and VIPs fall in. At the front of the airplane stands the chaplain, priest, or rabbi and they say a few words and then recite a passage from scripture. It is the same verse for every fallen hero. It is Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? 
And I said, here am I, send me. Send me. It is the mantra of this generation. Send me. Send me to Iraq. Send me to Afghanistan. Send me to the aircraft carrier, the submarine, the corps, the division, the battalion, the company, the squad. Just send me. Send me to serve my country. And with all the losses, they keep coming, and they keep saying, send me. In the special operations community, we've lost over 300 men and women since 9-11 and thousands severely wounded. But our accessions rate into SOF remains at an all-time high. Our first termers re-enlist at a rate of around 70%, and our second and third termers around 85%. They keep signing up, and they keep returning because they see heroes that inspire them every day. Heroes they want to be like. Heroes like Warrant Officer Romy Camargo, 7th Special Forces Group, who was shot in the neck in Afghanistan and is paralyzed from the neck down. Romy and his wife Gabby are two of the most inspirational people you will ever meet. There is no remorse in Romy. There is no self-pity. There is only a sense of honor for having served. Every week, Gabby helps Romy put on his uniform and go to an event where Romy talks about his service and how great it is to be a soldier. Or they see heroes like Sergeant First Class Ranger Corey Rimsberg, who was hit by an IED in Afghanistan. Corey was in a coma for three months. He is partially paralyzed, blind in one eye with some significant brain damage. You may re remember seeing Corey in the First Lady's box during the State of the Union. With all these injuries, Corey has never lost his love of the Rangers or his sense of humor. I had the honor of retiring Corey as one of my last official acts in the military. During his remarks, he poked a little fun at us Navy SEALs, but was gracious enough to say that, well, maybe the Admiral was okay. And he reminded me of a mug that the Ranger Regimental Commander had given me a couple years before. And on the mug it said, God made Rangers so that Navy SEALs could have heroes too. <laughs> And they just keep saying, send me. And they see soldiers like this young ranger I met in Bagram who had lost both his legs to an IED. He had tubes coming out of every hole in his body and was badly swollen from the blast. And at first I thought he was unconscious, but the nurse assured me he could communicate. But she told me that while he couldn't talk, he could sign. He had learned to sign as a young boy because his mother was deaf. And beside his bed was a card with the hand gestures printed on him. And somehow he must have seen that look in my eye and realized I was feeling sorry for him. And he lifted his head, and I read from the paper, and he said, I will be okay. One year later, I saw him at the Ranger Regimental Change of Command. He was on his prosthetic shorties and challenging all the other Rangers to a pull-up contest. <laughs> and he was okay. The other story I like to tell is about Joe Kapicheski. Sergeant Joe Kapicheski, Ranger was hit by a, a, a grenade that was thrown into his striker in 2005 in Iraq, blew most of his right leg off. And Joe had always wanted to be a Ranger squad leader. But after the accident, it was pretty apparent that Joe probably wasn't going to walk on this leg again. But Joe refused to give up. And after months and then years of trying to get the leg to work, he finally told the surgeon, take it off. So in 2007, he had the right leg amputated uh, below the knee. And then he came back to the Ranger Regimental Commander, who at the time was Colonel Eric Carrilla, and he said, uh, Colonel, he said, I want to be a Ranger again. I want to be a squad leader. And Carrilla said, well, if you want to do that, then you're going to have to go back through the Ranger indoctrination program. You're going to have to show that you can be a Ranger, that you can run the five miles, that you can hump with a rucksack the 12 miles, that you can parachute, that you can fast rope. If you do all that, Joe Cap, then we'll let you be a Ranger again. And Joe Cap did all that. And I met him in 2010 when he had done his rehabilitation and was back in his first deployment in Afghanistan. And there's this great picture of Joe Kapicheski, and he's at about 8,000 feet altitude in the mountains of Afghanistan. And he's on the ground and he is changing out his prosthetic leg for another leg so that he can keep moving. So they see people like Joe Kapicheski and they keep saying, send me. Or they see Medal of Honor recipients, like Leroy Petrie, Dakota, Dakota Myers, Sal Guenta, 
men of incredible courage and equally incredible humility. Or they hear the stories of the fallen, Hero heroes like Petty Officer Mike Monsoor, who jumped on a grenade in Fallujah to save his fellow SEALs. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Or Lieutenant Michael Murphy, who was mortally wounded when under heavy enemy fire, he climbed to the top of an escarp uh, escarpment, hoping to get a final radio message out in order to save his small squad of SEALs. Also awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously. Or Sergeant Robbie Miller of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, a member of the 3rd Battalion, 3rd Special Forces Group, who sacrificed his life during an intense firefight in Konar Province, Afghanistan, to save his team captain and fellow soldiers, also a Medal of Honor recipient posthumously. Or they hear of the courage of First Lieutenant Ashley White, a beautiful young woman who was a member of a Special Operations Cultural Support Team. She was killed along with two other soldiers by a pressure plate IED while on an operation in Afghanistan. But if that isn't enough, they see their parents as examples of what they want to be. So very many of our young soldiers are sons and daughters of military men and women. Marty and Deanie Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, had three children in the Army. Dave and Holly Petraeus have a son in the Army. Ray and Lindy Odierno, the chief of staff of the Army, had a son in the Army who was severely wounded. John and Darlene Greenert have a son in the Navy. My former deputy, Lieutenant General John Mulholland, and his wife Miriam have three children in the Army. And my command, former Command Sergeant Major Chris Ferris and his wife Lisa have a daughter in the Army. And General John Kelly and Karen, who had a son that was killed in Iraq. And you never, ever see either John or Karen regret his sacrifice. But these are just a few. There are tens of thousands of children who come from military families. And they keep signing up and saying, send me, because they know they are part of something much bigger than themselves. They may not recognize it immediately. I used to say that there are four stages of life in the military. Every young man or woman signs up initially because military training is a challenge and they want to be challenged. They want to see if they can be a Navy SEAL, an Army Ranger, a Green Beret, a Night Stalker, a Marine, an infantryman, or a tanker. They want to test themselves. Once they've passed the test, life in the military seems to be one big adventure. You're jumping out of airplanes, you're locking out of submarines, you're landing on the deck of a carrier, you're traveling to far off lands. Then somewhere along the way, the job becomes a profession. You realize you want to be very, very good at what you do. And you want people to recognize you as a true professional. You work, you study, you gain the experience you need, and you become a professional soldier. And then, and I'm not sure when it occurs, but life in the military becomes a calling, a belief that, you are doing, that what you are doing requires your total investment because it is right and just and good and honorable. It used to take decades to go from believing it was a challenge to understanding Isaiah 6-8. Now for those warriors in Iraq and Afghanistan, it takes only a week in combat, and even the youngest soldier understands the nature of the calling. And, when that calling, and with that calling comes a belief that you are doing something worthy, worthy of the support of your nation. Every soldier must have the knowledge that if they fall in combat or training, their families will be taken care of. The government does a lot to help with our fallen. Life insurance, medical care, the support infrastructure. I will tell you, as Americans, we actually should be very, very proud of what our government does for our men and women. But not everything is covered. And consequently, having support from folks like you is critical to caring for our families. And education is the game changer in the lives of our children and our spouses. According to government surveys, college graduates earn more than twice as much as high school graduates. The more schooling you have, the more your average salary increases. Individuals who attend college are employed at higher rates and with greater consistency. Individuals who attend college save more money. Individuals who attend college tend to make more informed decisions as consumers. Individuals who attend college have greater work opportunity. A public health survey says that college graduates live longer than high school graduates. College students tend to have jobs 
that are more meaningful and interesting. College students are more satisfied with their career and their daily life. College students have higher self-esteem. They are better at solving problems. Plato once said, the direction in which education starts a man will determine his future in life. Everything is better with education. Everything is better with education. I'm so convinced of this fact that life after the military for me will involve higher education at the University of Texas. When I was in Austin several months ago, I had the opportunity to give the commencement speech, as David said, for the graduating class of 2014. I gave them some lessons learned from basic SEAL training that I hoped would arm them for the rigors of life. The lessons were simple and I think universal, but one lesson was different than all the others. Nine of the ten lessons focused on the individual, but the moral of the second lesson was that you need the help of other people to weather the tough times. You need friends, colleagues, and the goodwill of strangers. You are those people that will help some struggling child get through life. Through your goodwill, some young spouse or child will have a future. Through your goodwill, the patriots that say, send me, will know that the great Americans that they serve are behind them. What isn't well known about the Isaiah 6-8 passage is that later in the verse, Isaiah asked the Lord, how long? How long will I have to keep fighting? Well, only God knows the answer to this conflict, but after 13 years and the troubles of the world continuing to mount, I do not see an end in sight. We will need your support and your benevolence for a long, long while. Thank you so very much for everything you do for the men and women in the armed forces, and particularly for those fallen patriots who gave everything. Thank you very much.